building custom 18650 batteries is a fun hobby and works very well until something goes wrong. So today I experiment with another method and I want you to help me decide whether it's worthwhile. Lithium batteries are very dangerous if not treated correctly. They can pose a significant explosion and fire hazard. Please consult a professional before attempting these procedures. In addition to that disclaimer, I'd like to point out that this video is not intended to be a guide. Instead, it documents experimentation of a method of building a battery that has pretty low requirements. But that's the point. I'm looking for some feedback before I commit to building a much more serious battery. So please watch carefully as we proceed. Previously, I made this ultimate 18650 battery building guide. In it, I covered exactly what an 18650 cell is, the type of batteries individual cells can be found in, how they're built in these commercial applications, and also a bunch of maths you need to know before you build your own. I'm not gonna cover all of that again in this video, but it might be worth watching the original just because some important safety aspects are covered, such as bogus advertising and clones. Let's do a quick recap of the traditional way of building these batteries, starting with the frame. We can buy ready to go, clip together pieces, and of course, as makers with a 3D printer, we can design our own, which is what I did in that video, producing this tight hexagon frame, which perfectly suited my installation. With the cells in place, we now need to join them, and utilizing this thin metal strip with a spot welder is the most popular way. After experimenting with your nickel and your welder to get the settings just right, you can then build up your battery, attaching the strips to create cells in series and parallel to your desired configuration. This is pretty reliable, but it's also quite a slow and laborious process and very repetitious. However, when done, you can use a multimeter to confirm the location and charge of each bank, labeling as you go, before finally soldering on all of the balance wires as well as main terminals to finish the battery. Of course, for it to be truly complete, you'll want to cover all of those exposed terminals. And now, of course, you can use your battery in the application that you built it for. Mine being to run this Monoprice Mini Delta 3D printer without it being plugged into the wall. And everything worked perfectly until I had a cell failure. Here's the battery that I built in the previous video. Its voltage was reading low and it couldn't be charged with errors coming from the charger. After pulling it open and measuring with the multimeter, it turns out this bank of seven cells were dead. To try and replace them, I had to rip off the nickel strips that were previously spot welded on. Not only is this difficult, but it leaves behind these viciously sharp remains. So despite removing the nickel strips from either side of this bank of cells, there was no way to get them out due to the remaining nickel strips holding everything in place. Therefore, I'd have to remove more of those even though the cells are good or cut away part of my printed frame to get the cells free. And that would mean spending a lot of time and creating a lot of mess, grinding off all of the left behind bits before rebuilding everything with the new cells in place. And for me, that's the problem. This method is not at all serviceable. And with a big battery project on the way with much more expensive cells, I wanna avoid a repeat. And that means avoiding soldering as well as spot welding. Let me start by saying I'm not inventing spot welding or solderless 18650 battery packs. There's a product called Veruzend that's been around for a number of years that offers exactly this. They have modular clips and then a threaded terminal that you use to connect the individual cells with these pre-made strips. And the reason I'm not using them is they can only handle up to 3.5 amps of current each. And that's not gonna cut it for the new battery I need to build after fixing this one. I'd also need at least seven of these kits, so the cost is going to add up. Instead, I'm gonna take inspiration from another battery I previously built, where I machine custom terminals to suit the configuration. So here's how my concept works. Obviously, we start with 18650 cells. And the first thing I'm going to retain is a 3D printed frame to hold everything perfectly. If we have the opportunity to manufacture this part to get it spot on, then we'd be silly not to do so, in my opinion. This frame could be modular or designed per battery to suit specific applications. Next up, a custom metal terminal. The frame would be designed to leave the maximum amount of the positive terminal exposed, which is around 8mm in diameter. I would then have a boss on the terminal that protruded and could make good contact with this surface. The bigger the surface area of the boss, the more current it should be able to safely handle. To keep this boss centered on the cell, my plan is to have some little locating pieces that extend into the top of the frame between the cells. The final shape doesn't really matter, but here's one such example, and we can see how it locates inside a matching hole on the frame. 
Unlike this large battery I built, we don't have the luxury of built-in threaded holes. So to hold everything together, we're going to need some bolts that extend to either side, allowing the terminals to be clamped firmly together to ensure there's no points of high resistance. Of course, as you're seeing it here, this would make a short, so if the bolts did go the whole way through as pictured here, we would need to insulate them just to keep everything safe. Like with the existing techniques, the beauty of this system is that it's scalable. Here's a 2S configuration with a terminal extending between the two, and a 3S configuration using two of the long terminals this time. Let's talk about some of the specifics of this system in terms of amperage carrying capacity or ampacity. Each terminal that touches the cell has a surface area of around 50 millimeters squared, and we can use a bus bar calculator to see how much ampacity this will allow. As we can see, in copper or aluminium, we should be able to safely handle the current of pretty much any 18650 cell. For instance, these VTC4s support a continuous discharge of 30 amps. For the overall terminals that need to handle the current of the whole system, we can easily up the ampacity just by changing the thickness. For this battery, I'm using 3mm plate, or for a higher demand battery, we can up the thickness, for instance, 10 millimeters as shown here. If we take a cross section of the terminal, we can take measurements from CAD to work out the ampacity. Putting our height and width into the calculator and tweaking the terminal width or thickness until we reach the numbers that we need. This type of design does have an Achilles heel, specifically the contact patch between the terminals and the cell. Basically, we need as perfect contact as possible. If there's a little air gap for one cell, the other cells will need to do more. And if the terminal is misaligned and crooked, or perhaps the mating surfaces have imperfections that don't let them touch, that will create points of high resistance and hotspots, which is quite dangerous. One way to combat this is for each of the contact points to have a hole where the bolt goes through to clamp them down, and that should give pretty even pressure and keep them nice and flat. However, I was still fearful of problems from imperfect mating surfaces. I spoke to my patrons and ended up with several types of conductive assembly grease. I wasn't sure which was best, so I got one of each. For this battery that's static, I think I'm going to go for the carbon conductive assembly paste. We can see that it's like thermal paste, but instead adds electrical conductivity. And by the description here, it's actually ideal for my application. Compared to the other two I've got here, it's also got the lowest value for resistivity. The other two seem better suited to moving mechanisms. So I won't use them now, but I've got them on hand if I need them down the track. One thing to note is that none of these are particularly good for you. We can see we have a risk of allergic reaction, cancer, and particularly bad for aquatic life. On top of that, these are combustible. Confession time. The first time I tried to buy conductive gel, I actually got this stuff intended for ultrasound. So at least I'll be covered on the odd chance that I get pregnant. So despite the hazards, I'm at least now on the right path. I made sure to glove up and not take any chances when using this stuff. Starting with a quick test with two offcuts, measuring the resistance between them without any paste in the middle, applying a thin layer to the inside, and then once again measuring the resistance to make sure that I could at least match the initial result. This might be conductive, but I had to make sure it was not less conductive than nothing at all. With all of the ingredients in place, I finalized the design in CAD. I had to match the form factor of the original battery, keeping the hexagon shape to hold the cells in place. But then we have these cutouts on top to help the terminals locate, and a series of holes between the cells where they'll be clamped together. As usual, I used the free and open source Kirimoto to generate toolpaths, milling them with a two operation process on the Carvera desktop CNC. With the first small terminal complete, I prototyped the 3D printed parts using only one sixth of the hexagon, making sure all of the clearances were right and everything fitted together perfectly. With everything confirmed, I machined the remaining terminal pieces on the Carvera, and I'm using aluminium because it's cheaper than copper and that this thickness has plenty of ampacity spare. Post machining, the only thing left was to add the M5 thread to each of the terminals. I also made the final 3D printed parts using PETG for its thermal stability. Frustratingly, both myself and my bolt shop didn't have any M3 by 80 bolts, so I had to use this printed jig to make my own by cutting down M3 threaded rod, cleaning up the cut ends, and then using strong thread locker to semi-permanently attach a nylock nut on one end. I also purchased some more cells. These were brand new, but cheap, because someone else had purchased them and never completed their project. They're generic, but they're plenty for this particular battery. I now had everything ready, so let's put this thing together. The first job is the easiest, and it's simply putting all of the cells into the frames. And here, as you can see, I've matched the configuration from last time. This is very satisfying because the frames have a perfect fit. 
Next up, I cleaned all of the machined terminals as well as the ends of the cells before carefully applying a thin layer of conductive paste to each of the terminal protrusions. One at a time, I would then carefully lift and place them on the assembly, with the next one being on the other side so I could get a single bolt through to prevent them from falling off. Those little locating triangles were very handy here, getting everything aligned, and I'm also pleased to report that there was no way that this bolt could touch the terminals and create a short, particularly when paired with the nylon washers. With the first six bolts finger tight, we can inspect how things are going. And I'm glad I went for a series of retaining bolts across the terminals, as they have just enough flex to not really be making contact with the outer cells. And that brings me to the slowest part of the build, inserting the rest of the bolts. This is slow because getting the nylon washers centered is a little bit fiddly, and just because of the sheer quantity involved. With all of these finger tight, the terminals are touching, but we can see that some of the cells are still free to rotate. So now, with a little ratchet, I went along and torqued all of the bolts. Nothing too tight, just enough to ensure contact on all of the terminals without damaging the cells. And this locked all of the cells perfectly in place without any rotation. At this stage, the battery is pretty much done. We just need to add some wires. The cells are uncharged, so we can see we're reaching just over 20 volts on the main terminals. They can be marked with a sharpie, and then each of the terminals for the balance wires can be measured and marked as well. With a bit of crimping, the balance plug as well as the main terminals were completed and the only soldering for the whole battery was for the XT60 connector. I did one last double check with the multimeter to test the voltage was going up for each wire in the balance plug and then placed the protective caps on each side, torquing them down, completing the battery overall. Being success, this can now be charged with a regular LiPo hobby charger. The final check is to plug in the battery to the 3D printer, turn it on, and have it power up without any other cords attached. It's finished, I'm happy, but that doesn't mean that it can't be improved for the next version. Firstly, I'm happy with the fundamental design approach of this battery. It does take some time to put on the paste and then tighten all the bolts, but there's no doubt it's way faster and way easier than spot welding on nickel plate. You don't need to invest in a spot welder either, although you will need a CNC mill. A lot of the time during assembly came from these finicky nylon washers and trying to keep them aligned as I tightened the nuts. For this battery, I had to match the original configuration which was extremely tight to package. That's why all of the terminals jut into the internal cutout, there just wasn't really a way to move them in without colliding with the cell. So here's a quick mock-up of how I would do things differently with a bit more freedom. Firstly, the cells are in a grid pattern which gives us more room in between them. I would utilize this to have a central hole for clamping, as well as some holes like before to lock into the terminal. On the terminal, we have our bosses to touch the cells, as well as our bosses to locate on the frame. But here's the difference, instead of having a single bolt and nut going the whole way between the two ends, the underside of the frame has this cutout, in which this joiner is designed to go. An M5 nut can slide down into each end, I would then plug the gap with this filler, that's just to stop the nuts from falling out of place and that allows a bolt to be used from each side. We can see that the bolt interfaces with a nut on each side, they don't touch in the middle, and this should give me sufficient clamping, but also add a lot of convenience when we bolt on the terminals from each side, and that should also reduce the bulk at the end of each terminal, one of the problems with the existing design, making it much thicker than the old battery, requiring me to print and fit a spacer to get the new battery to fit. One more thing to note, although I'm not using a BMS for this battery, I'm absolutely using one for the big one. At this stage, I'm happy because my Monoprice Mini Delta is once again portable, but I'm still seeking your feedback before I advance with my big battery. So please head down to the comment section and give me your best feedback and constructive criticism. Maybe there's something I've missed or there's a material or technique that I just hadn't considered. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my patrons for helping out with their tips. And until next time, happy 18650 battery building. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.